Welcome to Space to Grow, brought to you by Kachuna Lube Kitchens and Sonus Bathrooms Ireland. In this podcast, we explore how the spaces we inhabit shape us as individuals. I'm Natasha Rocco Devine. And I'm Lisa Cannon. Well, in this episode of the entertainment series, we are absolutely thrilled to have hairdresser to rock stars and royalty Nikki Clark joining us in the Devlin on Zoom. He's going to share his experiences with the spaces he's inhabited throughout his life and career from taming the tresses of the Beatles to David Bowie, George Michael and Princess Diana to his own award-winning hair products and tools. It's the man himself. It's Nikki Clark. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Good to see you. I mean, the last time we spoke was, I think I was in sunnier climes, not quite so sunny here, but good to speak to you. Where are you, by the way? We're, we're in the Devlin. It's a beautiful cinema here in Dublin. It looks so. Great. We're very well lit. Look yeah, at us. We're, we're, we're hogging well all the lit. limelight I'm very here. Not well lit. <laughs> oh, you look great. You're I, I want your lighting cameraman here. Now. <laughs> next time. Next time when we get you in person. Okay. Nikki, listen, welcome to the podcast. Sure. Listen, we're, we're all friends at this stage, Nikki. And, you know, I love talking about how you got started. And I want all of our listeners to hear as well because you kicked off age 16, you know, in, in a beautiful mm. salon, well, a local salon called Leonard's. And of course, you were only on, was it was it £12 a week or something? <laughs> That's I was. How you, I, was you on started. In, I was on yeah. exactly £12 a week before tax, I might yeah. add. Eleven pound thirty three. Why is that in your memory? It's amazing, isn't it? That, I know. I keep a lot memory. of things in here, but it was a great kickstart for you, and that's how you decided. You know, that's where you wanted to start a professional career. But what was it like going back then? You know, starting out as a young young guy. Well, actually, I mean, I look back now, and I, I feel very privileged because, in fact, um, this was a um, a Mayfair salon, a very very um, upmarket salon, and and I was rightly advised by a friend of my sister's actually a mobile hairdresser who said look you know don't bother going to a college or anything just go to a really good salon and start at the bottom you know sweeping the floor and doing all that stuff so she actually gave me two salons one of which actually was not really suitable which i went to first a very kind of a, a ladies who lunch type salon but the other one was leonard and i you know i just know that i felt comfortable there but they actually didn't give me the job straight away it was very much a kind of well we let you know and it was almost three weeks or so so there was you know it was, it was tricky but it was a you know looking back now I was getting the tail end I mean this is 1974 so I was getting the the tail end of um all these great people that were there you know there was Daniel Galvin there and John Frieda and you know Michael and John from Michael John I mean all of these great names that became big names you know in uh, you know at that time in the 70s and 80s and still today but um so it was great from that point of view and in fact although I was only there for a year and a half and I actually left with John Frieda in 1976 it really kind of cemented my time and so much so actually that I mean I'm just going off agenda here but um I held one of the Leonard reunions this is the third one that I've held other people will hold them as well just only last Sunday actually so it was the, the the great and the good who are slightly older now um all getting together so it was kind of it was a, it was an amazing time and uh, an amazing time for fashion as well because you know we were getting in hair terms it was very much kind of coming from some of the you know the sort of the bobs and sassoon type stuff to suddenly we were got in all into kind of farrah fawcett was kind of queen and, you know, it was a, an exciting time from that point of view as well. So it was it was great fun. Obviously, we know your follow up story and journey to date. But let's talk about how your career exploded. I mean, it obviously sounded very exciting from the start. Like you've tamed the tresses of the Beatles, Prince Diana, David Bowie, George Michael, to name a few. To name a few. Like, how, what was your yeah, They're all dead, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't want to put too fine a point on it. <laughs> well, what, like what's been your pinch me moment in any of these? Or is there any moments that have stood out for you in this process? Uh, there's this a journey? lot of pinch me moments, but for different, uh, different reasons. I mean, you know, I always say that each of the decades have had great pinch me moments. I mean, the seventies purely because for the, the sheer fun of being somebody so young and, and, and green, but just sort of in that in, environment. I mean, the eighties was, I suppose, when I really, you know, kicked off my editorial career. So, you know, traveling the world, you know, for Vogue, et cetera, is not exactly a hardship. Um, the nineties of course were, was when I opened my own salon. So to have, all of that kind of 
unbelievable publicity that was just has never happened before, not even with Vidal, actually, when you measure it um, without being too egotistical about it, um, and probably won't happen since, uh, you know, again. But it was just a very, you know, odd time, you know, but lovely time. And then, of course, in the 2000s to be, you know, being awarded the OBE by the Queen. I mean, you know, that's another pinch me moment. So, but I think, as I say, I mean, a lot of them aren't necessarily hair standout moments, you know. Um, I mean, so, I mean, I suppose David Bowie would be a, a pinch me because, you know, at 13 years old, you know, I'm watching Top of the Pops and Starman and then I'm camping outside his house with Boy George, you know, in Beaconsfield. I mean, you know, so, you know, they're kind of major moments. Did I do major things on his hair? No, not really. But but just to be able to, you know, to do his hair and talk to him and and do all those things. I mean, you know, that has to be pinch me uh, moment uh, of, of the highest honour. Absolutely. I mean, God, all the litany of names you've mentioned there. I mean, I'm an obsessive Beatles fan. I know you love George Michael God, and you yeah. became friends with George Michael. I mean, that's it. You do become, yeah. I suppose, friends with some of the of the clients that you bring in. But I mean, how does that work then? You mentioned there about David Bowie that, you know, you're obviously a fan, but, you know, is there a line where you don't cross? Did that happen with George a bit because you were friends? Well, you I know? think the different things were different. I mean, we 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 with um david it was much more about not letting on that i was a fan and that uh -huh. i knew every word of the back catalogue so because yeah, yeah. he's very much a forward thinking person and and he's very interested i mean they say you shouldn't meet your heroes but that's not true at all for him um and it was in fact at one point it was very much kind of like you know i feel like i'm going to get caught out because you know he's talking about arts and this and even coming from the vip room he was hanging out in reception and you know, talking to everybody and me including, it was a bit like I wanted him to go just before we got found out. But um, so that was different. With George, it was kind of different because I don't know why. I mean, because his sister did his hair for a long time because she's a hairdresser. And so when I started to do it, it was, I don't know why, I think we lived near each other. Um, my ex-wife, Leslie, um, was uh, somebody that, would, that, you know, really kind of spoke to him um, on a, sort of a normal level so there was I think actually his mother was called Leslie so they might have had something to do with it but we would often have dinner together and so it became, and he would turn up at the house for instance he'd sit in the kids bedroom so it was very much a different level there so yes I was doing his hair but he was one of those people that we did actually you know um speak to a lot and you know go for dinner just intimately either the three of us or with Kenny um so that was a kind of a different relationship so yeah I mean I'm glad to say that there are a lot of people that you become very friendly with I wouldn't say that everybody is on a you know I don't know kind of a buddy buddy relationship but you know there are a lot of uh, famous acquaintances that you cannot help if you've been doing their hair for such a long time that you know you're you become part of their their thing as well you know, you're in the game a long time, you know, since the 70s. And um, I'm not disclosing your age, but you're now uh, a father of two. You know, it's very worrying because next year it's going to be 50 years in the business. That's a worry, I'll tell you. And, and of course, you know, when we were telling people you're coming on the podcast, everyone's like, oh, my God, Nicky Clark, sure, I've used his products well. since yeah. I was, you know, a, a youngster yeah. right through to the teenage. You know, how do you keep it fresh all the time? Because we've seen you on umpteen television appearances, every magazine cover. You've obviously worked with supermodels. We mentioned the Beatles. Yeah. You've got an, an OBE from the late Queen, Elizabeth. So how how do you keep it fresh, you know, now into your 60s you know, and keep the brand going? I think, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, I love this profession i love hair i love and i don't you know i love working with celebrities i'm not going to pretend you know i'm a fan for god's sake but there is something kind of wonderful about working with people that you know they're probably a little bit nervous of you they're probably saved up or they've had it bought for them and but to see that kind of transformation that this profession is able to do in a relatively short time you know within a kind of an hour or so you know you can kind of go uh and, you know, you're seeing the, the, the delight on somebody's face. And it's interesting because, you know, be, throughout COVID or before COVID, you know, I always kind of slightly beat myself up a bit about, you know, it's not really serious. I mean, it's just hairdressing, for God's sake. You know, it's not even to be awarded things. I mean, I'm being awarded for doing my job that I love doing. Um, but there was a part through COVID where, you know, I would see people that just wanted to feel better. 
and that whether that was going to the gym or going to doing whatever or having their hair done and so i kind of sort of saw it differently you know that they that we all have a part to play in just making some little piece of somebody's life you know just better and i don't have to keep comparing it to you know the starving millions or whatever it is and you know it's it is a job that i do and i'm just blessed at the fact that i'm still people still want me to do it so that's kind of when they when they stop wanting me to do it, then I'll give up. Well, we might fly over soon. I we're gonna. We, we need some haircuts here. Look we're at gonna us. come over <laughs> shortly. To London. And and obviously, speaking of London, you I look go back fine, and forth. You. Uh, thank you. Well, I go back and forth to London a lot, and I think yeah. we need fishing. A, by the way, fishing. <laughs> <laughs> we need a trip there soon, so we have a reason, maybe. So, um, but you have homes in London and Ibiza, or family homes in London and Ibiza, and obviously you're so creative. So do you bring that creativity into the interiors? Are you involved in that process? I'm really curious. Do you love design? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I do. I mean, I actually don't have a home there. I mean, my daughter has bought a home there. And, um, but Ibiza is part of my background since the 70s. I mean, my um, first girlfriend was actually, was uh, Lulu's sister. And the Lulu and the Bee Gees, you know, were there in the 60s. I mean, it is a kind of a hippy-dippy island, um, for anybody that doesn't know it. Not just a clubby island. And so it's been part of my, you know, background for a long time. And even though I've my house was actually in Mallorca um, for many, many years. You know, we were only, a, a, you know, a hop, skip and a jump. So I, I always loved that part of Ibiza. Um, but I suppose the whole kind of interior thing has always been part of my makeup. And, you know, not least that one of my ex-girlfriends was Kelly Halpin for a couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, having said that, I already done my house you know just before we met and I always remember her thinking you know when she first came to the house I think she was kind of you know hoping that it wasn't going to be all kind of I don't know chintz or whatever I mean we actually have slightly similar taste actually although I have to say hers is a little more kind of slightly more kind of formalized whereas mine is a bit kind of off the wall now and again a bit of beef but, you know <laughs> but it's kind of it, it's it, it's neutral based you know which is but I like things that, that have the grandeur, I suppose, that comes with, uh, you know, the, the way the salon looks and things like that. We have, we, you know, I, I suppose there is a kind of a house style that is attributed to me because we did it in the salon, first of all. Yeah. And do you do you like to change up your style in your home? Like I've very kind of delicate palette. I know Natasha's probably got a stronger palette. What, what's your color scheme? If you don't mind just being nosy, like what, what's in your homes? What do you like? No, I mean, I, I you know, I don't. And it's a it's a it's a source of annoyance sometimes to my wife now who, you know, there are it's it's very much the case that I don't change things at all, really. I mean, she just says I just add things. But um, it's very difficult when you've got substantial pieces there but no it's a it's a neutral palette you know I mean my thing is always that regardless of how much money you've got or how you know most rooms if you get the sort of a neutral palette and you get the lighting right and if it smells great and you've got flowers you're kind of three quarters of the way there really and so I just think in those terms I don't it's not a place that is um you know that is austere you know I look at a very modern minimalist type of features and i love it but it's not particularly practical and it's not really me so you know there is a heavy emphasis on you know big pieces and and, and being comfortable you know like for instance it's carpeted who has carpet these days you know it's like everything's all about wooden floors and a rug here and a rug there that ain't, that ain't me you know it's like when people come in it feels like a home so there's a lot of that. I mean, some people do say, actually, it's been on TV a few times. I think, um, you know, even on Keith Mellon, I mean, um, he's, Lemony sort of, he said, it looks like you've just been ram raided by a Ralph Lauren furniture store, <laughs> which and there, is a, there is a bit of that, I must say. There's a lot of bloody sofas around. But, uh, but yeah, so I, you know, I did it myself. And, you know, it, was, it has that feeling of comfort and slight grandeur as well. Ooh, lovely. Now, of course, we all know that you've tamed the tresses of Princess Diana, the late Princess Diana. Did you ever yeah. get into Buckingham Palace? Did you Were you allowed into the quarters? How did you do her hair? Well, I mean, first of all, actually, Buckingham Palace is where I did um, uh, Sarah, the Duchess of York. So it got to the point where I'd be there three or four times a week. So, I mean, without oh. sounding blasé, <laughs> I mean, you, I that's kind just, of knew, blase. I knew that my is way blase. around a little bit already. And then, you know, you get to know everybody. Um, actually, of course, the, the, the Princess of Wales was in, was in um, KP, Kensington Palace. And um, so it was a different side. But it was, it was an odd pairing because I'd met 
Diana at a number of fashion shows that we did. And at that time, she was um, uh, keen to wear only British designers. So she would come to a lot of the fashion shows that we were doing, you know, Victor Edelstein, Jasper Conran, whatever, all those, Bella Freud, whatever. Um, but she would come to the rehearsal. So I, I got on to sort of, you know, not, you know, nodding terms a bit. And then, of course, um, my son, Harrison, went to Weatherby. And um, it was the last year that, of course, William was there. So every morning we were sort of on the school run together. So we were still we were on back on nodding terms again. So it was one of those. So in fact, actually, the times that I did it, which was I wasn't her regular hairdresser. It's actually Sam McKnight who um, was responsible for that. But um, the reason it became so noticeable because it was the night that she went to Pavarotti in the park and she got completely drowned um so uh, it went from me being thinking oh my god this is holding up but it can't hold up forever um so actually thinking hey, she looks quite good with it wet actually <laughs> so it just started this whole thing of people sort of thinking that it was me responsible for it all the time and you know as much as yes i did do it you know on occasion uh, it wasn't me that kind of kept it regularly i mean the, the the time that i did it it was actually sarah who said you know look we're going out you know can can you do my mate? My mate's hair as well. Oh, my mate, I love it. Just happened to be, you know, princes and, and princesses. Thought, no, well, of the I'm world. not sure. I've got to be somewhere. To... <laughs> she's, um, I'm such a huge fan of her, um, and I obviously the crown and you know shows out at the moment. Yeah. And she's always shown in fashion magazines and things like that. But, but when you have you ever seen the crown? Did you ever get to watch any of the I episodes? Did. I, I, I thought the first two were great. Yeah, because um, you know sure her, so you obviously have reference. I saw bits of it, I wasn't mad. mad. I, I, I found it less interesting. I mean, the stuff with Diana, I didn't see, to be honest. I mean, I think I might have seen a bit of it, but it's always kind of odd. But I loved the bit that was of the Queen from the 40s and the, and the 50s stuff, you know, with Princess Margaret. And, you know, and again, you know, with Margaret, it's, you know, she had this kind of very formidable um, sort of um, image. And in fact, I remember we, I did Serena, Linley's hair for her wedding, you know, uh, and um, David Linley is obviously M Margaret's son. And I remember we were going through, uh, actually Kensington Palace again, going through the the drawers, looking for a tiara. You know, it's like oh that one, or maybe it was this one. You know, it's that like one of those. So, but it was actually quite nice to have to see a different side of Margaret that was this fun-loving, warmer, younger, you know, glamorous person rather than the person that I think she. You know, people saw her later as being, you know, fairly austere and, you know, unapproachable. You have so many stories, Nikki. Like we could talk to you for hours. You know, the thing is, you could probably get people in trouble. You have so many good stories. That's the point as well. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to think that. I mean, I'm actually trying to write some of them all down now for, for, um, for my sort of anecdotal book. And and people do say, "Is oh, is that going to be a problem?" With and I've got nothing bad to say about anybody. I mean, there might be one or two that it's just. A little iffy, but even those I might leave out. So, and you know, there's always that thing that people want things to be, you know, sensationalist and slightly, you know, um, you know negative about people. But I think if the story is interesting enough, or maybe there might be, I don't know, might not be. I think you can still hold people, you know, from that point of view. Let's hope. <laughs> And if we don't get to London, is there any way your products can come to Ireland? Because I'd love, well, I'd love you that. to have I mean, this. in fact, that's what, that, what we would say. Yeah, you know, I'm eating today. So, you know, there, there's been a huge upshift now in a lot of our products that are going out to South Africa, to America, you know, to um, uh, other countries in Europe and stuff like that. So it would be quite nice to, you know, to get back in Ireland. As I, say, I hope that I hope these talks are um, you know, get fulfilled because we've got so many great new products now you know, that, that are out and, you know, I'm really kind of you know, making great waves in terms of um, not only the innovation of these products, but also in terms of just things like packaging and stuff. I mean, you know, we were the first to be in completely plastic free packaging and we've done that since 2017. So there's a lot of new stuff that we're doing that, that I'd like to think that we're ahead of the game all the time. So that's no, all good. Absolutely. Well, we can't wait to get them on our shores. Please. You've got two hair brand ambassadors here, as we said. There you go. Uh, um, Nikki, you know, just kind of moving to the end of the interview now, because we're, we're running out of time, sadly. Um, you know, you you also talk about your spaces that you've lived in. We, You know, I beat them, Mallorca, your own home in London. You're there in your ex-wife's house. And of course, the name of our podcast is Space to Grow. So um, how have you grown in your spaces over the years, not only with your salons in Mayfair? I know one or two, you know, have closed over COVID time, but yeah. how how has your space grown over the last 
50 years? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky question because, of course, you know, you're dividing your professional life and your and your personal life. And I certainly know that my time in Spain, um, mostly Mallorca, but of course it was Ibiza originally and now it's a bit more Ibiza again, um, as kind of was somewhere that it wasn't, it never felt like a holiday. It felt like the place that I lived, you know, you know, for a couple of months or whatever it was. I mean, I don't go there for as long now because I think I have other commitments, but there was a time when, you know, we would try and take a, a proper chunk and it was a place that I felt good in, you know, I was very fortunate to have a place that I could step out the door and the sea was almost in front of me. So, and I just, I do think it makes you feel different, you know, when you've got that, the, the, the professional side of things is another uh, completely different aspect because, of course, you know, when we moved into Mount Street in 1991, it was in the middle of a recession. And, you know, that street that became at one point the most expensive street in the world, actually, when I joined it, there were 11 properties empty in that street. And even when we were, you know, overlooking Barclay Square and people would say, oh, you're so lucky, you know, you're overlooking the square. And I go, this was my second choice. I actually wanted to be further up the road. And, you know, it, it didn't, people didn't understand that. So, you know, it was a very special time. It was a very different time because, you know, what we were doing was so different. You know, we, we made it look different. You know, there was the only place that, you know, we had Louis Vuitton trunks lying around and, you know, uh, bold staircases and, and, you know, mirrors and stuff. A lot of it was because, you know, we didn't have that kind of money, but we were very fortunate to um, know somebody that had ran out of space and wanted to put a lot of that furniture in situ in London rather than in, his, you know, in a lock up in Oxford Street. Uh, so, you know, he actually lent us all this furniture and actually bit by bit, I think he wised up actually that, you know, he would come along and go, oh, somebody wants to buy that mirror or something. And, you know, and I go, oh, really? I said, oh, what's, what's your best price for that one? And so I'd end up buying it, you know, so there was a lot of that going on. But, um, but you know, I love the fact that, you know, I always tell this story that the, the night before we opened um, officially, unofficially, which was on June, uh, May 13th in 91, um, it coincided with Vogue's 50th anniversary at that time. I mean, they've gone past it now. And um, I remember it was about 11 o'clock at night and I was in a tracksuit and filthy and still cleaning, you know, myself. And in through the, in the door walked Gianni Versace. And, you know, didn't speak much English, but he had two sort of bodyguards with him. He was obviously staying at the Connell, which was just down the road. And he was obviously here for the Vogue anniversary. And, um, and I... You know, I he said, what is this place? I mean, it looked nuts because it had these mad statues and, you know, it had carpet in places. I mean, it's a hairdressing salon. And he and he said, he said, what is this place? And I said, it's a hairdressing salon. And he said, my God, it's fantastic. He said, I must send Donatella here, which actually he didn't do. He sent me to Donatella, which wasn't quite the same, but, you know. <laughs> I think it's um, not bad. That, but it was, that, it was that thing of the madness of having something that was just so different from what salons were at that time. So I'm very proud of that. Um, as our space then and we were there of course for 21 years before we moved around the corner and what do you think is the most uh, like on a personal level you know your father your grandfather you've you're like literally you've an OB I mean the list goes on but what has been your personal most transformative space in your life like the most kind of big change that ever happened for you and was it in that salon or I, I, it probably was I mean it would be so difficult because as I said before each of the different um spaces if I take Leonard as a space it was incredible then you know to move with John to a very small intimate space in Marylebone that wasn't uh, trendy at all then um, but then to kind of have um, the opportunity and I suppose space is that opportunity of being able to um, be my own creative spirit you know working editorially with all the magazines that we did so that was kind of it but I suppose you know you can't I can't help but feel like home was Mount Street because we were there for so long and we did so much and there and in fact I think it resonated with a lot of people because you know when we closed down um, Carlos Place which was around the corner um, I knew there would be publicity but I didn't expect the onslaught from you know the Times and the Telegraph and the Mail you know every day and yet not one of them even though we were in Carlos Place for 10 years not one of them mentioned Carlos Place it was all it was as if I'd it was like the end of an era because 
it was Mount Street that closed, and yet we closed that ten years previous. So, so I think that it did. It certainly resonated with people because we did something so so very very different. And I have to say, I'm proud of the fact that we did it. And you know, it was a real build it and they will come moment. And it hasn't really been done since. I mean, not in hairdressing in any way. No, absolutely not. Well, we're sadly out of time, but we've got one question each. Normally we do a big quick okay. fire round, but we, we, we've we got one question each. And I suppose my one is for you, just a quick short answer. Um, if you weren't picking the profession you're in, which is hairdressing, which you've done for 50 years, is there any other profession you would have gone with, Nikki? Well, I mean, I'd like to say that would have been a rock and roll style, but, you know, <laughs> I can't actually play an instrument. I'm not sure that I can sing, but um, <laughs> but that would have been the one my go to top of the list, but, uh, or, you know, an actor of some sort. But again, I don't even know if I could act. So. <laughs> but, Good uh, answer. I like that yeah, word. They're, they're kind of wish for ones. <laughs> I can see it happening. Um, and also, last but not least, what is your biggest accomplishment in your life? Oh, Oh, I mean, you know, it's probably my children, probably. You know, you know, so, you know, you have sort of had two sets, you know, that with a great, great big gap in the middle. And um, you know, so my, you know, my son and my daughter, you know, are in their you know, mid to late thirties. And of course, my other uh, children are three and six. So it's been kind of, you know, and again, sort of blessed with boy and a girl, boy and a girl. So I think it's probably my children. But, you know, I can't not say that that, career that hopefully has has meant a lot to a lot of different people and uh, and actually if we have time quickly I mean in in when we closed it down I got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of you know goodwill messages and people crying down the phone and all but, but there was one that I remember you know that that kind of resonated and it was um somebody that said look my name is I can't remember what it was but she said you won't remember me I was a receptionist 25 years ago and I had a different name then as well but she just said I want to say thank you for you know being able to to be part of that thing where I could I don't know you know hang out with Christian Bale one minute you know um, talking to David Bowie another and watching Paulie Yates try and try and pay the bill with a plastic bag full of change (laughs) What a story. What a story. Nikki, thank you so thank much you so for your much. time. You're, You're a global brand. We are thrilled to have you on the podcast. Thank you. thank you. And of course, we want you back in Ireland soon, okay? We're going to get you face oh, to face. When the products are there, I'm coming over to, 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 to promote. Wonderful. Nikki, thank you so thank much you for being so on the much. podcast. You're Congratulations on everything. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. For more on Nikki, check out NikkiClark.com. This episode was brought to you by Kachune Lube Kitchens Ireland. Check out their latest collections at kachunelube.ie. And this episode was sponsored by Ireland's leading bathroom brand, Sunnis. It's time to reimagine bathrooms. Be inspired at sunnisbathrooms.com. And if you want to keep up with the latest from Space to Grow, make sure you hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And if you can, leave us a rating or review. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next time on Space to Grow.